Today we're going to be taking a look under the hood and underneath the Nissan Rogue to see what's inside and how it works. Now this vehicle is designed for the masses who want something very functional. So we're going to see mechanically just how simple things are laid out if it's also just as functional. I mean if you ask your kid to draw a soccer field, a school or even a house for that matter, they'd probably draw one of these in front of it. And here we are under the hood of the Nissan Rogue. We have a 2.5 liter four cylinder engine situated transversely for front wheel drive. It is a direct injected unit and we've got the intake on the front side and at the back side we have the exhaust. Now while there's no turbocharger back there on this one, this engine has been replaced with a three cylinder turbocharged variable compression unit, which is gonna be a lot more complicated. So if you are looking for something simple and easy to work on, it's best to stick with this four cylinder model. Now made it to this engine underneath there is a JATCO continuously variable transmission. We all know how we feel about Nissan CVTs. Now if we take a look at how this engine works, you've got fresh air gonna be drawn in through the duct over here and then straight to the air box where it's got the air filter, past the mass airflow sensor, and then straight down into the drive-by wire throttle body. Now this intake has variable geometry which means there's an electric motor down there that's going to turn flaps inside of here to help with air swirl and then the air is going to be sent directly down into the engine there to get burned. Looking at the engine itself we do have a plastic valve cover at the top here and if you squint hard enough you can actually imagine the oil leaks that are going to start to form between it and the aluminum cylinder head down below. Now changing the oil in this is pretty straightforward it takes 0W 20 weight oil which is nice and cheap and you've got easy access to the oil dipstick at least you've got a dipstick unlike some BMW. Changing spark plugs in this thing are really straightforward. You just got one, two, three, four coils that unbolt and then your spark plugs are underneath. Looking at the fuel system, now we do have that low pressure fuel pump in the tank that's going to bring gasoline up to this high pressure fuel pump over here, which is going to bring that fuel pressure up to 1 million thousand hundred PSI and send it down underneath this air intake here. And while you can't see the fuel rail, it does reside down below. But one thing to note though is that this has direct injection only, which means that the air is going to go into the engine first before the gasoline can wash it off, which is prone to carbon buildup and stuff like this PCV hose just going to dump dirty air back into it which isn't really going to help. I mean if you really want to do race car stuff you could install a PCV catch can over here to catch some of that oil to prevent you from having like a check engine light one mile after the warranty is done. Now taking a look at the exhaust setup back here it looks like you got a lot of room to upgrade this to a turbocharged unit and you've also got the heat shielding already in place looks like Nissan was probably planning something here. Now the catalytic converter bolts directly up to the head here which means you don't have a separated exhaust it's actually integrated down into the head. Now speaking of the exhaust, we do have an exhaust gas recirculation set up over here where it's going to take poisonous gases, send it down this tube over here and put it directly into your air intake so you increase the chances of your carbon buildup. I mean seriously, you've got EGR and you've got PCV and you've got EVAP and whatever else they dump into your intake and only direct injection. It seems like they were engineering this thing to clog up just after the warranty was done, seriously. This is kind of weird, this air duct that goes to the air intake here just kind of sits here and draws air from this tiny little gap between the air dam over here. It doesn't turn downward, it doesn't turn forward. It's kind of like that kid in high school that had no objectives in life. Changing the air intake on these guys are pretty straightforward. Just two clips and we pop this up and then I can remove the air filter. Now with that air intake out of the way, we've got wide access to the transmission, which everyone loves to hate. Now in an effort to increase reliability, they have this transmission cooler over here where it's going to exchange automatic transmission fluid on the inside with these coolant hoses coming in from the radiator. Now one thing I don't like is how loose these hoses are just dangling right next to the fan. They couldn't find a clip to clip it back. It's kind of cheesy. Now also hanging out in front of the transmission is the starter, which is pretty easy to get to. You can just unbolt it and get it out. At least made the starter pretty accessible because with the start stop systems these things will wear out a lot faster especially when you're driving and stop and go traffic with four sweaty guys after baseball practice. Now while the service manual will want you to drain and refill the transmission from down below there is a dipstick tube which you can see runs up to this over here however the dipstick tube is not included and batteries are sold separately. Now because this is just a transverse engine you've got two main mounts and then of course the torque mount down below you got one over here on the passenger side which looks so giant for no reason and then there's one over over here on the driver's side just underneath the battery that mounts to the transmission. Also for those of you watching in like 10 years from now and you got to do motor swaps on these, the engine will clear the frame rail on this side and the transmission will clear the frame rail on this side so you can use a cherry picker and pull this off instead of dropping the subframe down below. And I do like how the radiator support is a bolt-on style which means that if you crash this is pretty easy to just unbolt and replace as opposed to welding on metal and if you need to work on the car you can just unbolt it and take off this whole front end and get lots of access inside of there. In terms of the electronics in this car things are pretty standard. You have your wiring harnesses which are nice and secure unlike some Fords would just leave wires dangling. You have the battery which is right on top on 
unlike some GM cars that put it down inside of the fender or underneath the passenger seat. The ECU is located, however, in the engine bay, but at least they've set it back quite a bit to the strut tower and not in the crumple zones over here where it can get written off in an accident. And the fuse box is here nicely labeled and pretty easy to access with the exception of these wires that kind of look aftermarket. Now at the front here you have your LED headlight and at the top here you have your DRL. Now luckily these are separated units so you can replace them separately. They have their plugs over here and looking down inside of there the headlight bulbs are not really replaceable so if one of these gets damaged or you have to replace them you're gonna have to replace the whole assembly as with all LED lights nowadays. That's some real cost cutting. I remember when these fender brackets used to be made of metal now it's just a piece of plastic. Speaking of fender brackets take a look at the height of these mounts over here. I wonder if the unibody itself was made for a smaller Japanese market vehicle and then they've added on these taller fenders to give us a meaner vehicle. Braking system is pretty straightforward. You've got a vacuum actuated pump which is pretty old school and a typical master cylinder. Over on this side here you can see the ABS pump. Again very simple hydraulic motor actuating that for your safety systems. Speaking of safety systems this here is a radar system for the safety connect and if you look down in behind here you can see the sensor is actually mounted inside of the bumper itself. So every time you replace the bumper you will have to do a calibration on that sensor. Now looking at the drive belt setup it is a simple setup by the diagram however there really isn't a lot of room to work in here. This is the little clearance you have for the tensioner that sits over here. Just rotate that and take it off. I wonder if it's easier to get at that from down below. Now replacing that alternator looks pretty easy however the service manual asks for you to remove this AC line over here so you can get more room. I wonder if you can just move this bracket out of the way and bend it out of the way because refilling this AC system is going to be pretty complicated. This one takes the R1234YF stuff which is pretty expensive and only certain shops can refill it for you. Now while the washer tank is located down in the fender and it's pretty easy to fill up over here one thing I don't like is how these washer hoses get swept up with the wiper itself. These hoses are going to flex back and forth and eventually fail. I prefer if they just mounted the nozzle to the windshield cowl and sprayed it directly on the windshield. Seems like a short sight for me. Taking a look at the cooling system, there is actually no radiator cap on the radiator itself. They've relocated it out to the coolant jug over here. The radiator itself is sandwiched up at the front here between the condenser at the front and the cooling fans at the back here. Anything to do with that setup, you will have to remove it as an assembly by removing first the front end of the vehicle, even though it looks pretty accessible where it is right here. Also, what's up with all the cooling lines that are insecure? It looks like the clips and hooks factory was probably closed down during COVID when this car was built or something. Same thing goes for this upper radiator hose over here there's nothing really secure it and the fan is like right there speaking of cooling we have active grill shutters here which are going to help with aerodynamics at higher speed but are going to open up at lower speed when the engine needs cooling if you're sitting there idling in the Costco parking lot waiting for your wife and here's a look at the active grill shutters from the top here you can see it only covers about one third of the radiator the rest of this is all open now here's another difficult one the water pump is a mechanical water pump driven off of the drive belt nice and old school yay not electrical like some other cars however in order to get to it you got to remove the alternator in order to get the alternator out you got to get all this other stuff out of the way so it's quite the job also down below there which interfaces with the water pump is the thermostat housing once again that is an old school style thermostat now, having an old school style cooling system is great for service because you can just bleed and burp the system yourself when you're done as opposed to having a computer open up all the valve and then do the bleed procedure now we're going to take a look underneath the Nissan Rogue and the first thing we'll notice here is that there's a stamp steel oil pan which is pretty nice and easy cheap to replace in case you do damage it by going over those speed bumps a little too fast in the school parking lot and over here we do have a canister style oil filter which I like because it's a lot less mess than the cartridge style one. Now just above that oil filter there is a tiny little oil cooler over here. Now just in front of the oil pan you can see the AC compressor which would be accessed from down below. Taking a peep at the drive belt setup from underneath here it looks like you might be able to get the water pump out from the bottom here without getting off all that alternator stuff from the top. Now the third engine mount is bolted to the subframe. This is a torque mount. It doesn't fetch the weight of the vehicle. It just prevents rocking when you change gears. Unfortunately from down at the bottom here if you follow that low radiator hose it goes into the grate beyond. You will have to remove either the alternator from the top or the AC compressor from the bottom in order to access that thermostat because it's just right up against the fan. Speaking of the fans here we have two giant plastic fans up at the front here to do the job of the cooling. Switching gears now to the CVT transmission here you can see the stamp steel oil pan. We've got the 
the drain plug over there. In order to fill it, you'd undo this bolt over here and put a special tool in here, which has got a valve in it, pump the fluid in. Then you got to make sure it's at the right temperature by checking the OBD2 port and draining out the excess. I know it's quite a task, but if you want the CVT to last a long time, make sure you do those fluid changes, especially if you want to hand this car down in five years to your grandkid. Now, the power from that continuously variable transmission is going to be sent to the front differential, which is integrated inside of here. But then on the back side here, we do have the transfer case. Now, the transfer case has an hydroelectronic clutch inside, which is going to engage the all-wheel drive system based on vehicle conditions. And in order to service this, you do have your fill and drain plugs over here. Oopsie, it does look like we have a little oil leak here, and this car is only two years old. Now, from that transfer case, here's the prop shaft that will go down to the back wheels. I don't like how you have this cable here so close to a very fast-moving prop shaft. And throughout the rest of the uncovered body, you can see the prop shaft moving down the center of the vehicle down to the rear differential. Now, from underneath here, just next to the transfer case at the top there, you can see the rest of the catalytic converter coming off the engine and those gases are going to be sent over to that flex pipe over there flex pipes are not preferable nowadays because they do crack and break over time and you gotta weld on a new one that exhaust is then going to go over this subframe over here to the next catalytic converter which is nice and easy and accessible to chop off if you live in the wrong neighborhood and then the exhaust gas is going to flow down to that resonator at the back there quick look at the steering system there's a look at the steering shaft as it comes down into this eps steering rack now the steering rack has a rack mounted motor kind of located just behind there before it goes out to the tie rods. Taking a look at the suspension from underneath here and you can see we do have a stamped steel subframe and these edges are super sharp so if you are doing an oil pan because these always leak make sure you wear your mittens or your welding gloves or something because you can get hurt here. Now as with most Nissans nowadays we are using an aluminum control arm and you can see an integrated ball joint down over there. Check out this little cuddle here where you can get a socket onto that bolt for the lower control arm when it inevitably seizes on here and you're going have to torch it out and here's a closer look at that ball joint you can see it uses a pinch bolt design which means that these studs always get stuck in here and you got to hammer it to get it out you've also got an aluminum knuckle and from the back here you can see the single piston disc brake caliper kind of surprised they went with a single disc because these are still pretty heavy vehicles a double piston would have worked nicer now these engines do have timing chains which means that you don't need to change it over the life of the vehicle or CVT for that matter. There's one timing chain that goes up to the camshaft and one that comes down to the bottom inside of here to the oil pump and balance shaft assembly. Now having a balance shaft is great because it makes this four cylinder engine pretty smooth, but I bet that three cylinder engine vibrates like a vibrator, I guess. Take a look from the back of the Nissan Rogue. You can see this is where the exhaust and the drive shaft come back towards the back here where we have the rear differential now the rear differential has got this electric motor on it which is going to activate and deactivate this drive shaft for less drivetrain losses the thing i don't like is how low it sits with this exposed wiring you can easily damage it especially when you're rock crawling with your nissan road and the rear differential itself is pretty basic it is quite small however you do have your drain and your fill ports here for your service oil axles at the back here are pretty straightforward as well they're not too puny like some other cuvs we've been seeing now the rear knuckles here are made of aluminum and with bolt-on bearings you do have a lot of corrosion between steel and aluminum which means that you probably will need a press or a slide hammer or something to change this out when it starts to fail in like eight to ten years now the muffler at the back here has a hidden exhaust tip and it should be cheap and easy to replace however they did not add a flange at the back here which means that you'll have to actually chop it off and re-weld it or replace the entire thing all the way up to the resonator where there is a flange and now we'll have a listen to the exhaust Taking a look at the rear suspension underneath the Nissan Rogue and you will see we do have a stamped steel subframe over here and most of the multi-link components here are made of steel. Now using a multi-link design is a little bit complicated. From this angle here you can see this bedpan one that holds the spring and this forward one over here. These both have camber bolts over here that you would have to adjust and I'm sure you can already predict those are also going to rust out too in a couple of years when you got to replace these bushings. Let's talk about the sway bar. It actually forms a tiny bit of protection for that motor on the differential. However, I think it is pretty small and could definitely use some upgrading, especially seeing that this vehicle does have a sport mode, which means that you might be able to take this thing to the track or at least your kids might. Some really interesting and complicated fasteners holding on this heat shield. I don't know what's up with the way they spray these undercoating. It looks like a kid just took a crayon and started marking all over the frame randomly. And on the other side, there's this big giant cavity for hiding things when you want to cross the border. 
However, I don't like that they haven't covered up these two bolt holes here, which would probably be for your accessory hitch for towing. Your hitch would also have to hang down pretty low because this bumper is pretty low just to access it down here or you might have to make a hole or incision somewhere here. I don't like how they have all this exposed wiring so close to the edge of the bumper. As soon as you back into your kid's tricycle in the driveway, that's going to break off and cause you to have a check engine light malfunction. Now taking a look at the front suspension on the Nissan Rogue, you can see we've got a McPherson strut front suspension that plugs into this aluminum knuckle. Now one thing I don't like is that they're using a pinch bolt design between these two here, which makes it difficult when you slam your Nissan Rogue and you want to camber out the wheels. But it also is difficult when you have steel going into aluminum. This thing tends to corrode, so you really got to bang this out when you're changing the struts. Here you also see the sway bar end link which joins to the strut and the sway bar at the bottom there. Good thing they're both facing the same direction so you can get an angle grinder in there and cut them off when they have to be replaced. Now one thing I do like on the lower controller is that they've switched to a cross axis bushing going this way as opposed to a vertical one like they used to have because those used to wear out really really quickly. Now they've switched it back to this design which should last a lot longer. Now the sway bar itself is pretty tiny but changing that bushing again is not pretty hard. You got two bolts that you get out from the back side there. Lower control arms are made of aluminum and despite that they're still Swiss cheesing the inside here trying to save material. And here's a look at the integrated ball joint with the pinch bolt. Again I don't like pinch bolts because they get stuck. However it is an integrated ball joint so when it does go you're going to have to change the entire control arm. Looking at the brakes, it's a very standard ventilated disc with a single piston caliper. It would be nice if they offered the caliper in a painted finish because yellow calipers on a Nissan Rogue would make this thing stand out and help you find your vehicle a lot better in the Walmart parking lot. Taking a look at the multi-link suspension on the Nissan Rogue, you'll see it's actually a four-link setup. There's two lower control arms, this aluminum upper control arm, and then a radius arm up at the front here. Now the aluminum upper control arm has a ball joint that attaches to the knuckle, and it's got two bushings that attach at the back there. Now if you have to change it out, the service manual actually calls for you to drop the subframe in order to access those two bolts but if I were you I'd probably try to see if we can get those out with a wrench or something before we drop the subframe because that's a big job. One thing I don't like about steel subframes is that they rust and you can see there's already some surface rust building here but that surface rust is going to turn into structural rust in a couple of years and that's what often totals these vehicles. Sometimes the CVT might actually hold up a little bit longer than the subframe and then you end up having to either change the subframe or scrap the whole vehicle based on how structural the rust is. Here you can see the shock absorber pretty simple to change out just two bolts at the top and one bolt to the control arm down at the bottom there and here's the tubular radius arm or trailing arm if you want to say and hidden underneath that upper control arm is the sway bar end link it is made of aluminum and you can see where it attaches to the sway bar down there and this pretty big nut where it attaches to the upper control arm here. Now having this multi-link suspension setup is great for handling. However, it's not ideal for packaging because it's not as small, obviously, as a torsion beam like in a minivan, which means that you're not going to have as much cargo room inside. Now the rear brakes on the Nissan Rogue uses a vented disc with a single piston, tiny little caliper over here. It does use an electronic parking brake. Now good luck when you have to replace the ABS sensor on here because its harness is actually part of the entire harness for the e-brake system. So you'll be replacing all of those together. I I don't like how they use a cotter pin at the back here instead of a steak castle nut. I prefer the steak castle nut because these cotter pins always break off. And I thought this taillight was damaged here, but that's actually a feature. And we're going to have a listen to that engine. Those injectors surely make a lot of noise. And there's a look at the mechanicals of the Nissan Rogue. Now overall, I think this thing is actually built pretty well. It's laid out really well, easy to service, especially compared to the Chevy Blazer or the Ford Escape, which this thing competes with. Overall, time will tell how long these things will last. Previous Nissan Rogues have had issues with the CVT, we all know that. And the variable compression three-cylinder engine that is going to be replacing this has not been proved yet. But if you want a cheap cookie cutter vehicle with a warranty, this will definitely fit the bill for what many people are looking for. Now you let me know in the comment section down below, what do you think of the Nissan Rogue? Is it just another cookie cutter SUV? Or do you really just hate these things blocking the way at your local school zone at 8 o'clock in the morning? Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.